Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Stronsky, and I'm a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace in Washington, DC, in the Russia and the Eurasia program. And we're very um, happy to welcome you to this virtual event on the situation, ongoing situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. We're now almost two weeks uh, into some of the bloodiest uh, fighting we've seen in recent years, uh, with rising casualties, civilian and military on both sides, destruction of, of homes and infrastructures, and really a hardening of attitudes. Um, uh, towards the conflict uh, in both Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan. This is occurring at a time of tremendous political and social uh, unease uh, around the world uh, and a global pandemic, uh, all of which uh, risks further endangering human security uh, in the South Caucasus. We're also seeing geopolitical shifts, a very distracted uh, West, uh, a Russia that uh, has been struggling uh, in its response to the, the crisis uh, and a, a much more involved Turkey um, in the region. Uh, see some ceasefire talks just uh, begun about uh, two hours ago in Moscow. So that's a, that's a hopeful sign at least, uh, but we'll see um, how that uh, turns out. So today we're gonna talk all about that. We're delighted to have a live audience with us via YouTube. Uh, and we welcome uh, your questions via the YouTube chat. Uh, we urge you to send in questions as opposed to uh, very fiery commentary. Uh, and today we're bringing together uh, three uh, Carnegie Global of our Carnegie Global Centers, uh, Carnegie Washington, Carnegie Europe, and Carnegie Moscow uh, for this discussion. We have an outstanding panel of speakers today that I'm delighted to introduce, introduce them. Two of, two of them are, are direct uh, Carnegie colleagues of mine, and the other is a very good friend uh, of the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, so first we have uh, Tom DeWall, uh, who is a senior fellow at Carnegie Europe and used to be at Carnegie in Washington. He's a acclaimed journalist, author, analyst uh, of Eastern Europe and the Caucasus region with a specialty uh, in the conflicts and his writings um, are known, I think, to everybody in this uh, audience. We have Natalie Tocci, who's a director of the Institut Affaire Internationale in Rome. Uh, she's an honorary professor uh, at the University of Tübingen and a distinguished political scientist, international relations, uh, relations expert. She serves as a special advisor um, uh, to the EU. Uh, and we have uh, director uh, Dmitry Trenin, the director of our Carnegie Moscow Center, who has been with Carnegie uh, since the center's inception. Uh, and he is a prolific author, well-known political commentator, analyst uh, of, of Russia and global uh, geopolitics and global foreign policy. He chairs the Carnegie uh, Moscow Research Council on the Foreign uh, and Security uh, Policy Program. So I would like to um, start, uh, maybe I'll turn to Tom to sort of give uh, sort of a brief update of what, of what we know. Um, we've had some you know, increased fighting, but also some, some ceasefire uh, discussions. So Tom, I turn it, to, turn it to you. Thank you very much, Paul. And it's, um, I'm glad to join um, Natalie uh, and Dimitri as well. So let me just start by emphasizing the humanitarian dimension of what's going on. I think we're, we're seeing um, whatever else is happening, whatever the politics around it, of course, is incredibly complicated. We'll we'll focus on that. But let me just start with the humanitarian uh, aspect of this, that um, there have been enormous losses in the last uh, 13 days um, on both sides of this conflict. Uh, the Armenian side has released casualties, which, which now are run to more than 300. Uh, the Azerbaijani side, I haven't seen casualty figures, um, but they're almost uh, certainly a, as large. Um, Civilians have been um, targeted. Um, we've been seeing particularly heavy destruction and bombardment of the towns and cities in Karabakh, the Armenian uh, Karabakh Armenian population. There, we've we've had reports that uh, up to seventy thousand civilians have fled uh, that region. Um, um, such heavy bombardment that, that reporters only venturing onto the streets for a few minutes at a time at at, at points. Um, Amnesty International also reporting use of, of, of cluster bombs, so very concerning uh, civilian uh, casualty uh, rate in, in Karabakh itself. Um, and um, reports uh, of, of quite uh, daily um, uh, art Armenian artillery hitting uh, a series of towns, um, Tata, Bada, Beylagan, uh, Ganja, which are on the Azerbaijani side of, of, of the line of contact, and, and also reports of civilian casualties there. So uh, I just wanted to put that uh, at the beginning before we get into the politics, the terrible human cost of this. And of course, the, the both um, nations have conscript armies. So so the, the, the young men who are dying in, in greatest numbers are probably no more than 19 or 20 years old in, in many cases. 
Um, so um, I think w whether there's a, a lasting political ceasefire or not, a humanitarian ceasefire is needed by everyone to recover bodies and for exchange of prisoners and delivery of aid to civilians. So I hope, very much hope that at least comes out of the meeting today in Moscow. Now, um, this is obviously the most severe fighting since in the Karabakh front since we've seen we've seen since 1994 uh, and the ceasefire then. Um, the weapons um, are of a totally new generation and, and, and sophistication um, from the weapons of that earlier conflict. So we're seeing a, a new configuration of the conflict in military terms. Um, but we're also and also seeing something that obviously was not possible back in the 90s. We're seeing a kind of real-time information war. Uh, for those of us who've got the misfortune to be on social media, this is this is our kind of main impression of the conflict. Um, um, extremely toxic messages uh, on, on social media, with, with some good exceptions, I have to say. Um, and, um, and this, I think, unfortunately, is the product of more than two decades of, of kind of rather dehumanizing rhetoric on either side, um, in which um, has kind of reduced any empathy on either side for, for the grievances of the other. So sort of Armenians uh, calling the Azerbaijani side fanatics and savages, and then this uh, Azerbaijani discourse that Armenians are terrorists and, and fascists. We're, we're seeing this on on a regular basis. Uh, and I would say that that toxic discourse is not only aimed at the other, it's also aimed at people in the middle. It's aimed at intimidating those who want to articulate a third uh, narrative. People like Paul and myself who who try and and and, and a comment on, on, on this conflict on uh, on social media and and face a, a barrage of criticism um, from often from from both sides. Um, so um, just to turn now to why did this happen now? Well, obviously there's a there's a, a cocktail of reasons. I think I think Dostoevsky would say everyone is to blame. Um, it, it's a it's a in a sense build up over many years a failure of the international efforts. And the efforts, more importantly, I would say, of the conflict parties themselves to, to, to engage seriously with the resolution of this conflict. And also some short-term reasons. I think the short-term reasons are um, to do with the breakdown in trust between um, President Aliyev and Prime Minister Pashinyan, who came to power in Armenia in, in 2018. They started off very well. Um, almost this is the problem. that They started off almost too well. They had a very positive meeting in Dushanbe, and the Azerbaijani side began, to, as they saw it, to, to deliver on their what they thought was their side of the bargain, which was a um, improvement in the security situation, uh, a reduction in ceasefire violations, um, which was the uh, main Armenian demand. The Armenians were always saying, uh, "How can we talk if if you're constantly shooting at us?" A hotline was set up um, between commanders on the front line. Um, I think the Armenian side saw it that they'd been bought time. Um, the Armenian uh, would would deliver more private messages that yes, we do want to have serious, more serious negotiations, but we need to set our own domestic house in order. But that's not what it was seen in Baku. In Baku, they saw that they delivered their side of the bargain on the security side, and they weren't getting the political side that they wanted from from, from the Armenians. Um, then. Um, of course, domestic discourse very much drives this conflict. Um, so um, uh, particularly, uh, things began to break down really in, in August 2019, when um, Prime Minister Pashinyan went to Karabakh and gave a very patriotic speech, um, say, at the Armenian Games in Karabakh, in which he announced uh, Artsakh, meaning Karabakh, is uh, Armenia, period, um, which went down very well, of course, in Karabakh and Armenia. Uh, it's the kind of thing that his predecessors, even though the Karabakhis, uh, didn't had never said so emphatically. So, in fact, the um, the Azerbaijani hopes that a non-Karabakh Armenian leader would uh, be easier to talk to in Yerevan were, in a sense, reversed. That the Yerevan leader, uh, in a sense, was needing to prove his patriotic credentials in, in Karabakh. But obviously, this went down very badly in in, in Azerbaijan, and we've seen this. Since then, a progressive breakdown in relations, um, a very angry and rather bizarre session at the Munich Security Conference when both men spent a lot of time talking not about the, the present, but about the past, about some conspiracy theories about, about history were, were, were voiced. Uh, and then we ha had four days of, of, of clashes in the summer on the, on the international border. 
and then this the, this this outbreak of serious fighting. Um, now, I, I don't think anyone seriously doubts that it was the Azerbaijani side who started this. I may make myself unpopular by stating it so simply, but I, I think even if you read the Azerbaijani Defense Ministry's own statements uh, from the second day of the conflict, it's clear that this uh, they saw this as a as a well planned op operation to liberate our lands and, and that was very much the message um from the second and of course this 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 uh, operation has huge public support in azerbaijan including many of of president aliyev's domestic critics uh why did they start it um well um a few local factors was obviously it's um if you're going to have a military operation you need to start it uh, before the winter weather arrives in the mountains um um, the U.S. being distracted by its election as a co-chair, which might have tried to intervene to stop it in, in other circumstances. Europe obviously preoccupied with other things like the pandemic. Uh, Dimitri will talk a bit more about Moscow, but Moscow um, having this kind of balancing role in the conflict, I think caught rather wrong-footed by this, although today I think trying to reclaim the initiative. Uh, and of course the crucial factor um, uh, which is the much more explicit support of Turkey for Azerbaijan. Turkey has traditionally given political support to Baku uh, as its Turkic brother, but also at the same time um, tr said that, that said that Azerbaijan must try and resolve this peacefully, that Turkey didn't want a war in the Caucasus, and Turkey would help Azerbaijan in all international fora uh, and in the information campaign, but w w was a restraining influence on going back to war. Um, for whatever reasons, and we can discuss that, I'm not the big Turkey expert here, President Erdogan has made a different calculation here, whether it's to do with his domestic politics or his uh, wider kind of chess game he's trying to play with Russia, or um, to what extent it's actually, he's trying to devise a new policy for the Caucasus, um, we, we can discuss. Um, but the longer term, uh, just in, in a couple of minutes, just I want to mention the longer term issues, which is a kind of progressive breakdown of a serious peace process. And I think everyone is to blame here. The internationals, I think, were were have been distracted and fatigued with this conflict, despite its many dangers. I've said for many years, this is a smoldering conflict. This is not a frozen conflict. And the smoldering conflicts can ignite more than attention needs to be paid to the underlying grievances of this conflict. But, but, but unfortunately, that message um, really was not, was not, uh, um, on target for, for, for many international audiences who had much more on their plate. And unfortunately, the longer term issue, I think, can, can be encapsulated in two long term grievances, which are kind of mutually reinforcing. Uh, on the Armenian side, this uh, Karabakh Armenian fear that they're not, if they're not provided with security, the Azerbaijan will, will basically destroy them. And I think they, they would be pointing to what's happening then to this week to confirm that message, saying that. Azerbaijan for 20 years has not made, it's not agreed to meet with them, has not provided a single document on paper about what autonomy for them would mean that Azerbaijan had no serious intention of, of treating them uh, with respect and, and basically wants to destroy them. That's the kind of Karabakh Armenian message. And then the, the, the Azerbaijani message is that, for, is that not, if we leave for one moment the, the disputed region of Karabakh itself, that huge swathes of Azerbaijani territory, these uh, seven regions outside Karabakh have been, which were never part of the autonomous region, which were homed only to Azerbaijanis, to half a million people, have been under long-term occupation uh, for 25 years. And there's been uh, no serious engagement on the Armenian side of, of, about giving them up. Um, on the contrary, there seems that settlers have been put there and, and so on. So both sides, as it were, Really not acknowledging the, the the core issues of the other, talking past each other, uh, not really engaging uh, this very this very rather limping mince group mince group process. Uh, no direct talks between between the countries. So in a sense, one could see this building up over time. Um, and you know, in retrospect, th there were many red flags about, about what, why this should have been taken more seriously. Um, and it, it, it's. Of course, hopefully a new peace process will start in some format, which we can discuss, but it's, it's very tragic that that would have to be the result of many people losing their lives. And, and of course, we don't know how long uh, this will go on. It could go on for many weeks. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tom. And since you mentioned uh, you know, the Russian um, uh, 
approach uh, and Russia being caught flat-footed. I think I, maybe I'll turn to Dimitri now to get uh, the perspective of how this looks uh, from Moscow and and what 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 um, you know the Russian government's thinking and and what Russia um, Russian analysts are thinking about what's going on. So Dimitri, please. Thank you very much, Paul. It's uh, it's certainly a tragic moment to discuss uh, geopolitics, and I fully subscribe to what Tom has just said about the human toll, which is uh, which is getting bigger, even as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, let me make a few points. Uh, my opening point were, is that what we're witnessing today in Karabakh is uh, one of the elements of the fallout from the demise of the Soviet Union. This was the conflict, the first inter-ethnic conflict within the Soviet Union, and it's still going on three plus decades after it first started. And um, 30 years after the fall, Russia is uh, no longer the uh, only or even the dominant actor calling all the shots in what used to be Russia's uh, Soviet, the Soviet Union's republics and Russia's provinces before that. Um, the West may be distracted at this point, but, um, but other countries uh, uh, are stepping in, and uh, Tom mentioned Turkey, which is uh, a, not a new arrival, but it, it has arrived in, uh, with, with a lot more uh, visibility and uh, with a lot more resources than it's, than it's, than it's been present uh, in the region before. And uh, you also have to add Iran that's also looking at uh, what's happening north of its border. This is multipolarity in action. Uh, it's not just the global actors that are becoming involved in, in the various issues in the former Soviet Union, but some of the regional powers, and in this case, is, it's uh, Turkey and Iran. Uh, Russia is in, a, is in a delicate position. Paul, I, uh, I fully, uh, fully support that view. Um, Russia cannot take sides between Armenia and Azerbaijan for a number of reasons. One of the reasons being that uh, the country is uh, home to uh, huge diasporas from both countries, or let's say huge diasporas of uh, Arme people of Armenian ex extraction and of Azeri extraction, two, three million people each. Uh, Russia has a uh, uh, an alliance relationship with Armenia, uh, but uh, ironically, it, it's dealing with an ally that's uh, recently become uh, less loyal, somewhat less loyal, somewhat more critical. On the other hand, uh, Azerbaijan, which is not tied to Russia by any uh, treaty agreement, but tr in any treaty or any economic agreement of uh, integration type, uh, which has been, uh, in all uh, respects, uh, fairly independent from Russia since uh, the 1990s. Uh, it has uh, managed to keep a solid relationship with Moscow. So being a pro-Armenian or pro-Azeri uh, would be uh, extremely dangerous for Russia. Um, Russia also has to deal with um, a partner uh, a difficult partner, Turkey, with which it has dealt um, on a number of occasions in uh, several places like Syria or Libya. But uh, dealing with Turkey on the same terms as I think the Turks would, would prefer Russia to, uh, to, 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 uh, to act uh, would be giving uh, Turkey uh, an historical rival, um, some kind of a legitimate role in what used to be part of the Soviet Union, something that Russia is very reluctant to do at this point. Um, what, what's happening in uh, Karabakh is also a challenge from, um, uh, in another respect, if the conflict spreads, uh, Turkey might become more directly involved. Of course, uh, the treaty obligation um, commits Russia to aiding Armenia in case it is directly invaded by Turkey. 
Uh, Karabakh is not covered by the collective security treaty uh, that Russia and Armenia are parties to. And yet, if Turkey becomes uh, progressively more involved, more directly involved, uh, there will be an issue. And uh, that issue will be uh, very difficult to, uh, to come to grips with. Uh, Russia certainly um, does not want to uh, collide directly with Turkey. I don't think that Turkey is looking for a, a, a collision with Russia, but uh, the situation is, uh, is, is, is getting uh, more precarious. Um, in the shorter term, uh, there is an influx of uh, jihadis. We hear about it. We hear it from uh, President Macron. We also hear it from the head of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service. Uh, people talking about hundreds or maybe thousands of uh, jihadis from the Middle East who uh, are arriving or have ar already arrived in, uh, in, in the conflict area. And... Um, the previous experience with, uh, with these people or similar people uh, when the conflict was still raging in Karabakh uh, uh, in, uh, in, before 1994 was that uh, some of these people never left after the, the, the conflict has subsided and they went up north to uh, north, the North Caucasus and started making trouble there. Russia is the most concerned about the stability of its uh, um, uh, northern Caucasus, Caucasus borderlands. And let me uh, conclude by saying that uh, the, other, the, the principal thing that has changed in the Karabakh context, I think Tom discussed it, but let me just underline it, uh, apart from Turkey's more direct participation, is that uh, the Azeri patience has snapped. We all knew, I think, that the conflict will not remain frozen forever. And uh, time was working for Azerbaijan, not Armenia. And the failure to reach a peace deal uh, would uh, inevitably lead to war. And Azerbaijan would, uh, would, would, would start an offensive at some point to recover the territories lost. And now we, we have it. So Russia, which uh, heretofore has been... Um, uh, able to uh, manage ceasefires, bring the two parties to negotiate, to talk, to uh, respect the ceasefire, now is facing a totally different challenge, the challenge of, uh, of uh, nudging the parties toward some kind of a deal, uh, some kind of peace. And uh, unfortunately, my conclusion is that although uh, the leaderships in Baku and Yerevan uh, may understand the importance of uh, concessions to reach uh, some sort of a peace deal. This is not what their societies would support. And that, I think, is, uh, is the ultimate deal breaker. So I think we are in, 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 in dire straits there. Thank you, Dimitri. And, and I think, uh, you know, you also highlight, you know, it seems like uh, Russia, the West has all been caught a, a little bit, a bit flat footed, uh, but there were clear signs uh, brewing just as Tom was, was underscoring uh, that this was coming uh, and, and um, just uh, unable to, uh, to, to, we shouldn't have been as, as flat footed. Um, and also highlighting the hardening on, on all sides, which I think is going to be an issue. Maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, later because I think that's going to impact the, the move, the way we move forward. Um, now, Natalie, we, um, if I could turn to you to get some European perspectives and, and you know, what you're hearing and, and um, you know, your views uh, on the conflict and, and what role Europe uh, also might be able to play uh, here. Well, thank you, Paul, and, and, and thank you, Carnegie, for, for organizing this event. I mean, I think uh, for, for the reasons that Tom started off with, I mean, uh, the, the humanitarian tragedy is, is really quite tragic how little attention actually this, this conflict is, uh, this war uh, is, uh, is receiving. So thank you. Thank you for this initiative. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, as so much has been said, so let me perhaps focus on, on two aspects. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll end with the, with the European piece, but given that so much has been said about Turkey, let me perhaps uh, add a few uh, of my own thoughts. Uh, in some respects, I think um, may slightly differ, or at least add a different angle to what has already been said. Now, 
I, I obviously agree with, with both uh, Tom and Dimitri that uh, this is one uh, of, of the factors that explains why this is happening now and, and why it's happening the way it is. Uh, it is you know, absolutely true that um, Turkey has been providing unprecedented support you know, compared to uh, past decades to, to Azerbaijan. <clears throat> we've heard about the stories of the jihadis, we've heard about the drones, We've heard very clearly and explicitly the political support. I mean, this is the one external party that has not been calling for a ceasefire uh, and has actually been, um, in a sense, encouraging uh, the party that it supports uh, to carry on uh, so long so long as the situation is not, not reversed. So very clearly there is something important uh, that, that has happened and that explains why things have gone and why things are going the way they're going uh, now. Uh, and then I think the reasons for this are, are, are frankly speaking, fairly, fairly obvious. I mean, it, it really does boil down, as always, uh, uh, as almost always on, on foreign policy questions to, to domestic politics. Uh, Turkey is in a situation in which uh, its economy is not doing fantastically well. Uh, so what do you do when your economy is not doing fantastically well and you want to shore up uh, support? Uh, well, you know, Turkey is not alone in doing this. In fact, Russia does this as well. It kind of uses the foreign policy card. Um, and, and, and this is something that uh, we have seen, you know, sort of happening time and time again. And the fact that it's happening at this point in time, I think, it also connects to a series of other things that have been happening uh, at the moment, uh, meaning the fact that uh, Turkey, I think, on the foreign policy front, really had been feeling, um, if, you if we take the sort of past, I would say, five, six years, huh, uh, with kind of its back to the wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had been you know, basically sort of losing out on most fronts. Mm -hmm. Let's take uh, Syria as a very obvious example. Um, you know, let's take the, the way in which the um, sort of the energy situation in the Eastern Mediterranean had basically crystallized uh, everyone against Turkey alliance. And so Turkey has had basically felt, uh, you know, progressively marginalized, you know, pro progressively, as I said, you know, back to the wall. And all of a sudden, particularly through the Libya angle, the, it, the table started turning. So all of a sudden, Erdogan felt uh, strengthened, uh, so and then we've seen this, you know, in you know through Libya and then after Libya, we've seen it in the East Mediterranean. There is the uh, hope, which you know, at this point in time, sounds slightly surreal given the state uh, of uh, of the uh, of oil prices. But anyway, the hope of you know new discoveries in the Black Sea, uh, and now a, a, a sort of a, a more explicit role through a military presence in the Caucasus. So it kind of all, you know, it is part of the same story, and it's part of the same story in which uh, a Turkey that had been feeling marginalized on the foreign policy front now feels that it's back into the game uh, and uses also this particular card, again, to shore up domestic political support in a situation in which the economy uh, has been languishing. Now, having said all this, I also think that we shouldn't overplay this, this, this Turkish uh, aspect. This is ultimately a war between uh, Azerbaijan and, and Armenia. Uh, and, 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 and I think the Turkey angle is one of the factors amongst many that explains why things are going the way they are. Uh, I think, you know, even if we just stick to the, the military dimension and we just look at where Azerbaijan has been buying its weapons over, over the years, well, we know that 60% of those come from Israel, 30% come from Russia, 3%, these are simply figures, come from Turkey. Uh, so no matter how much support Turkey is providing at this point in time, I think it's important to keep perspective on this. I think this would be happening regardless uh, of Turkish support, to be honest. Uh, and, and, and I think that alongside this Turkey angle, there are the other aspects that I think both Tom and Dimitri were, were mentioning the fact that tensions had been building up for, uh, for, for years, the fact that Azerbaijan, and here I'm, I'm you know, I, I would agree with Tom, uh, and, and, and sort of the idea that, that Azerbaijan started it because Azerbaijan had an interest in, in starting it, which of course Armenia did not have. And, you know, we can't sort of, you know, uh, abstract ourselves from, from this very basic fact. The fact that Azerbaijan had an interest in starting it because what should have delivered peace was not delivering peace, the Minsk group. Uh, I mean, this had been kind of 26 years kind of in the making. Uh, and inevitably, it was, as I said, a question of, of whether or not a question of, 
of when. The fact that the rest of the world is distracted uh, by the pandemic, and perhaps, and this I put it as a question mark, um, I, you know, I, neither, neither Tom nor, nor Dimitri mentioned Belarus, uh, but I think this could also uh, be part of, of the story because it is clear that um, uh, unless uh, a regime, particularly a non-democratic one, uh, has domestic support, uh, at some time, you know, at, at some point, protests could actually spill into something more significant. Uh, and if there is something that can actually increase domestic support uh, for uh, the Azeri president, uh, it is this, uh, particularly at a, at a moment and, and looking like it is, Azerbaijan is going to look like the relative victor of, of this confrontation. Um, so I, I think we really, really need to sort of bring all of this in together rather than overplay the Turkish narrative, which, as I said, I think, yes, it's an important piece of the story, but uh, I, I, my general sense is that we're skewing uh, ourselves too much huh, in, in over-interpreting this. And finally, let me turn to, to, to Europe uh, and, and what is it that, that the European Union and its member states could or could not do. Now, the European Union does not have much leverage in this at this point in time. I mean, again, if we start, if our working hypothesis is that uh, who needs to be stopped, given that who started this is a Azerbaijan, I'm, 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 I'm exaggerating uh, the, the argument here, but just for the sake of argument. So who, you know, who has an interest in carrying on is Azerbaijan. Who has an interest in stopping it at this point, given the situation, it, it is Armenia. So presumably the European Union would only be able to really have leverage at this point if it had leverage on Azerbaijan, and it doesn't. Uh, and it doesn't because Azerbaijan has no interest in joining the European Union because Azerbaijan over the years has diversified its economic relationships. So in terms of actually at this point in time, having leverage and, and, uh, to, to drive towards a ceasefire, I don't see it. I'd love to, uh, as a kind of you know, uh, um, as, you know, if, you know, deep, deep, you know, deeply European, uh, Europeanist, um, but 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 I just don't see it. Which of course doesn't mean to say that uh, as and when, hopefully, uh, in 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 you know, in, in not too long, one does get to a ceasefire. Um, I don't, I, I, at that point, I do think that there is a useful European uh, role to say, and I say European because I mean both uh, EU as well as, as member states. Uh, one aspect is, is essentially that of not only consolidating a ceasefire, but ensuring that a ceasefire basically does not end up like the previous ceasefire, i.e. a sort of crystallization of the conflict that then erupts uh, uh, further down the line. Uh, and, and there I think there is, and this of course will not depend only on the European Union, it will depend, I would say, principally on Russia, um, as well as obviously on the conflict parties themselves. Is there an interest in having a European role, uh, as for instance, in, uh, in South Ossetia, in terms of um, uh, a ceasefire monitoring mission? So that's one, one possibility. Uh, and then, and, and here it is not so much a European Union question, but more of a member state uh, question, I think at some point, uh, when the violence ends, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, the, the, the debate will need to be had about the negotiating format, the mediation format. Uh, I mean, again, if we are in this situation, one of the reasons is that the Minsk Group did not deliver. I know no one's talking about this now, but that is a format that uh, reflected the situation in the 1990s. We're in 2020 now. Uh, are those still the relevant actors? Russia probably, and, and this is regardless of, of, of whether, you know, who's right, who's wrong, who supports what, who are the real stakeholders? Who are the real external stakeholders? Russia, presumably, yes, right? and it will continue uh, to be. The United States, question mark. Very clear that the United States uh, does not play in the corpuses today the role that it played uh, back in the 1990s. I think it is a question to be raised whether you know that there is a genuine interest uh, in the United States in remaining involved, and then comes the European component uh, of this. Uh, and here, I actually think you know I'm a big fan of contact groups in general, uh, and, and contact groups as a way of uh, actually bringing forward and giving substance uh, to to a European foreign policy. Uh, so I think this is something in. Uh, 
<laughs> not not easy to discuss it, but but I think it is it is a question to be raised as to whether rather than having just one member state uh, representing the European position in an eventual mediation format, uh, whether there should not be a group of member states uh, representing a European position. And now this would presume, and the reason why I talk about member states rather than the European Union as such is that I assume that it would continue remaining within the framework of the OSCE, and therefore an EU qua EU seat itself probably wouldn't work. Um, but you know, to sort of think of uh, the sort of a sort of JCPOA format, mutatis uh, mutandis, in in the Karabakh uh, context, I think is something worth uh, thinking about. Again, it's not the discussion for today, and but hopefully it will be discussion uh, on not too distant future. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Natalie, and we'll definitely get back to that question about sort of uh, evolvement of the uh, uh, of the, the negotiation format. We've gotten some questions in about French-Turkish uh, relations um, over the past uh, you know several years, and particularly over this crisis. So maybe when we're we're in the in the Q and A, what we can that you can touch on some of those. What I thought I would also do, um, since I'm the uh, uh, only American here, um, the, all the, the moderator, I'll just give a little bit of a perspective of how this looks um, from Washington, um, and I. First First of all, I just want to reiterate. I think you know all four of us um, sort of are, are very well on the same page in some of these uh, in some of our comments. So I'll try to go quickly, um, but I do think you know I, I would agree with Dimitri that we're really kind of seeing the sort of the continued legacy of the Soviet Union's collapse uh, play out uh, today. And I would highlight also Natalie's uh, a question about sort of the impact of, of Belarus, um, but also I'd also add on the impact of uh, uh, of Kyrgyzstan. Both of which I think show that in the post-COVID era, um, with you know economies uh, collapsing, um, there's a lot of fragility in these states uh, that we're seeing, um, and so uh, you know there are certainly domestic incentives um, to try to rally around the flag. So I think we are still seeing this this um, uh, this legacy of the Soviet Union's collapse. Um, I would also agree um, that we're also seeing sort of this shift from the sort of the post-Cold War unipolar world to one that is much more multipolar. Um, with a uh, increasingly um, uh, disengaged uh, United States. Uh, the American public is war weary. The American public is really not involved uh, in foreign policy to bring back uh, Natalie's, um, uh, uh, Natalie's point. Um, and um, uh, we're seeing a much more, um, uh, with, as the United States disengaged, we're seeing a much more um, uh, active uh, regional powers, whether that be Iran, whether that be Turkey, whether that be um, uh, uh, Israel, uh, I think we are definitely seeing um, all of that uh, occur. Um, I would also argue that we've seen a gradual withdrawal of the United States from this region. Uh, I would note that we're in the fourth, fourth year of the Trump administration, and I still have not seen a coherent U.S. policy uh, 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 towards the South Caucasus for this administration. Um, and this is also occurring at a time when, when we have deep strains in U.S.-Russian relations, U.S.-Turkish relations, and U.S.-Iranian relations. So I think this is all happening within that broader context, and we really shouldn't um, uh, uh, forget that. Um, the United States has been involved um, at some senior levels in the past, George W. Bush um, and at times uh, President Barack Obama, both on the Republican and Democratic side, senior politicians, senior leaders, both have felt burned um, by their stepping into this conflict. So um, I think that can explain some of the reasons why um, we haven't seen a whole lot of a senior level U.S. engagement um, today is because uh, you know many politicians here are throwing up their hands um, and not knowing what to do. Uh, but I think it is also exacerbated uh, right now, the slow pace of the U.S. response is exacerbated uh, first by COVID, second by President Trump's COVID diagnosis um, over the past uh, uh, week, which has just sort of put our foreign policy and our, our government into a, into a tailspin. Um, and then just the, the election. Um, you know, I do sort of see, um, uh, you know, uh, Vice President uh, Biden, uh, the Democratic candidate, has sort of put out some policy proposals um, a little bit more coherent, whether or not they, um, you know, it, it's a little bit too little too late. And even if there is a Biden presidency, that's still several months, months away. And that is still um, not very, very certain. Um, so, you know, so that's basically how it how it looks um, from from here uh, in the United States. Um, I was wondering, maybe since I, I started with with Natalie um, uh, and that question about about France, because we've gotten it several several um, uh, coming up. I, I was wondering, you know, what what if you could just sort of delve a little bit more into your thoughts about sort of the, the European role and and 
you know, if the Minsk group is is sort of reached its end, do you th actually think it, it has? Uh, maybe Dimitri and Tom can also add in, in onto that. Um, but also, I mean, what impact has been sort of the deterioration between the EU, between France um, and Turkey, um, and I think by default, Azerbaijan, you know, how is that playing into this? Well, I mean, it's, it's clearly playing into this <laughs> very, very heavily. Um, and, 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 and I do think that, uh, you know, the, the, the Turkish-French uh, set of um, disputes uh, from, uh, you know, from, from the East Med through, I mean, beginning with Libya, because this is, this is you know, really where it becomes so, so acute. I mean, it had been brewing for, for, for some time. It, it now seems to come, and this is why I kind of wanted to put this, you know, other side of the story. I think that there tends to be an overemphasis uh, uh, of this Turkish role, uh, precisely because uh, of a different set of conflicts that Turkey uh, is having, particularly with, uh, with, with France. Uh, but then obviously that has kind of spilled in uh, and affected uh, the, the narrative and the mood across, across the European Union. Um, now, France, I think, continues to be an important uh, stakeholder in this, but it's also very clear that uh, France stands very clearly on one side of this conflict. Uh, so I do think that if there is to be a European representation in a future uh, mediation format, uh, it would actually be healthy for this to be rebalanced. And, you know, there are several candidates uh, for, for the job. I mean, you know, a contact group has to be a relatively contained one. Uh, but one can think of Sweden, one can think of Germany, one can think of Italy. Uh, I mean, you know, I haven't given this much thought. What I'm trying to, to say here is that um, in order to express a European position, which on all issues uh, is varied uh, and it's diversified and at times it's divided. Uh, and in order to represent it while at the same time being effective, the idea of a contact group, so long as it's then connected to the institutional machinery, and again, I think that, you know, the, 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 the Iran nuclear deal uh, is, is, is probably the most pertinent example here, but there have been contact groups and other uh, conflicts uh, in, in the past. It's something that it can say, at the same time, sort of bring in uh, and, and merge, if you like, effectiveness and the idea of being flexible and nimble on the one hand, but also being to an extent representative and having just one member state that has a very clear position and positioning on this is obviously not particularly representative. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, Tom or Dimitri of... Uh... Well, can I just make a couple of comments? Go, go, okay. go ahead, Tom. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> make a couple of comments on, 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 on the Minsk group. I mean, um, just... Uh, a word of one word of defense of the Minsk group or any negotiators on this conflict, there have been many even before the Minsk group, is that you know, mediators mediate and, and, and the Minsk group is the form, but the content of the negotiations is trying to solve an almost unsolvable problem, which is the, the status of Nagorno Karabakh, which, as we know, tried to secede from uh, so Soviet Azerbaijan even in Soviet time. So, um, and so that's not you know, the, the, this. Um, immovable force of, of territorial integrity, um, this, sorry, the unstoppable force of, inter of territorial integrity meeting the immovable object of, of, of self-determination or, or, or vice versa um, has always made this incredibly difficult to solve. And, and also, as I mentioned before, in, in other conflicts, um, you know, the parties actually organize bilateral channels and dialogues, um, you know, Cyprus, Kosovo, we can name them all. They all have bilateral channels. The Armenians and Azerbaijans have not set that up. They've, they've blamed the mediators, but they haven't tried to negotiate between themselves. So I see it as a great failing of, of the conflict parties. Um, just And just a, a, one word on the Minsk group. A, again, um, there is actually a wider Minsk group, which was formed in 1992, which involves Sweden. Uh, I'm glad to say Sweden is the next chairman in office. She, Sweden has very good uh, institutional memory uh, and expertise on this conflict. Also involves, uh, uh, it also includes Turkey. So actually, there is a, the, um, but but it's defaulted in the last few years just to the three co-chair countries. I think there's an argument for for revitalizing that uh, multilateral uh, framework. Um, but I, I guess my bigger point is that there's a, I think, and this is the the conversation I've had half a dozen times now over the last few days is a fear amongst many interlocutors, including Armenians and Azerbaijanis, that the multilateral framework will be lost altogether, will be broken by this conflict, and that what we're we're seeing is a kind of um, Lenin 
uh, Ataturk Treaty of Cars um, Type 2. Exactly a century ago, Russia and, and Turkey were in the Caucasus. The Bolsheviks arrived, the, the, the Turks left, and then they, they, they kind of did their big geopolitical deal, the Treaty of Cars. Um, and, um, you know, so people are asking, uh, do Putin and Erdogan want to kind of do a deal, which may not even have, which may be about the Caucasus, but also about other things, but but on this conflict over the heads of Armenians and Azerbaijanis. And, and that's, I don't, something which I personally would not want to see. I don't think Armenians and Azerbaijanis would want to see. So I think the focus at the moment has to be to, to try and defend a multilateral framework in which Russia and Turkey can and, and should participate, but should not, should Dimitri? not supersede. Uh, if I may, um, I think I support a lot of what Thomas just said. I wouldn't blame the Minsk group. Um, I don't think it's about them. I think that uh, from uh, the Key West agreement to the Kazan formula, uh, the um, Armenian and Azeri leaderships uh, came uh, within a very short distance of, um, of a final agreement. But when they uh, presented those uh, necessary inevitable compromises to their publics, um, the publics wouldn't want to have any of it. So I think it's not, it's, the, the, the situation is really dire. It's not about the mediators, that's clear, but it's also not about the leaderships. It's about the people's societies, opinion leaders in Azerbaijan and Armenia who are simply not ready for, for any kind of a compromise. So I'm not, I'm not looking for peace in the, in the foreseeable future. And uh, the 30 years that have elapsed since the outbreak of that conflict back in 87, 88, um, have only exacerbated the situation. People were, I think, uh, more amenable to some kind of a formula while the Soviet Union was still around than they are now. With regard to Turkey, Russia, I think this is uh, something that Erdogan would want. Um, and I think this is something that uh, Aliyev would support. Aliyev said as much in one of his recent interviews, certainly um, that was the interview that was broadcast on Russian television. He basically said, great power Russia and great power Turkey need to come to terms. And that was a very interesting statement. Now, Russia is not uh, interested in elevating Turkey to that position in the South Caucasus. There is uh, no way. I mean, uh, Russia is certainly seeing itself as a uh, much more involved, much more powerful, and um, much more legitimate as a player in the South Caucasus. So the South Caucasus is not Syria, it's not Libya for the Russians. And when the Turkish foreign minister suggests that the Russians operate with Turkey in the Caucasus based on the Idlib or Syrian formula, the Russians reject that. So I don't think we will see that. Okay. in the foreseeable future. But otherwise, uh, unfortunately, my uh, my outlook is very, very bleak on that issue. Okay. Uh, thank you. I was also wondering, we've gotten some questions about uh, Iran um, and Iran's sort of a vision. And, and, you know, I do know that they've tried to, uh, or they've talked about refortifying the border. Some weapons have, uh, missiles have landed in Iran. But we also have a question of, you know, if we're going to look at sort of reshuffling how the multilateral process, is there a role for Iran? Um, is there a role, um, you know, for, for any other power? Uh, and then, Tom, we also had a, role, a question about the UK. So, so you're sitting in the UK. Is there, is there a role for the UK um, as well? Well, um, to pick up Natalie's point, um, you know, there are many new actors on the scene or, or different actors who weren't there in the war of the 1990s. The EU, you know, was not didn't have a political role back in the 1990s, but clearly one could see the EU, if not in a direct uh, political role, but in a reconstruction humanitarian role, being a very, very key player it, um, it, if we move towards some negotiations and, and deals. Um, likewise, Georgia was completely, you know, had nothing to say in the 1990s. It had wars of its own, but but has, but has, is now a, a stable country which borders both. And, and likewise, Iran, although Iran, of course, is much more problematic for 
for the United States and others, but um, Iran, you know, has a very large Azerbaijani population and also many Armenians. And, and so I think, again, one, one, one has to, there, there are many actors here who need to be at the table. As for the UK, where I'm sitting, it's not a member of the Minsk Group, which I regret, um, because the UK is actually um, the supporter, supporter of, of some great civil society initiatives. There are two or three uh, NGOs in London who work. I think the best NGOs who work in the South Caucasus are here in London. I've learned a lot from working with them. Um, and, you know, this is a, a track which has been very much neglected. Um, there is a, there, but I've been, I've been, you know, somewhat heartened, shall we say, not com um, amidst this horrible firestorm of, of discourse that there have been some brave voices speaking out saying, actually, we, we, we don't buy this war. We think it's a cynical ploy and, and, um, and we think it goes nowhere. Um, and so that, that, you know, the, the civil society element, um, alone, I think, qualifies the UK for, um, um, for, for, for being involved um, just a bit as well. Um, I was wondering, maybe you can uh, briefly switch to some sort of domestic issues in these in these two countries, um, but and also maybe uh, Russia's relationship uh, with both of them, because we've we've gotten some. Um, how consolidated do you think the Armenian and Azerbaijani governments um, are uh, right now? Do we see any signs of any any splits or any weaknesses? I mean, I think this is both, uh, you know, this could be a very dangerous scenario for, for both governments, but we did see, um, you know, on the Azerbaijani side, we saw sort of the fighting um, and sort of internal squabbles with Mekhtiev um, and, uh, you know, continued sort of reorganization of that government. Uh, and then in Armenia, you know, it's been a highly polarized uh, political environment since uh, uh, since 2018. And we've seen a constant stream of, of officials. I think the NSS director may, may have even uh, been forced out again today. Um, so uh, I'm sort of wondering, you know, what people think about about that. Uh, there's also a question about, um, you know, and I've heard this as well, I'm not sure I subscribe to it, but, um, you know, is Russia, um, you know, slow in responding because it, it doesn't particularly care for the, Demo the, the democratic Pashinian um, uh, and the new Armenian uh, government? Um, uh, and is this a way to sort of, you know, try to try to sort of weaken weaken that? So, so I'd really like to get a sense of, of uh, you know, from, from the group uh, about sort of how this might be playing out internally in, in these countries. Um, maybe, maybe Tom first, and then yeah. then Dimitri, I'll, and then I'll, if Natalie. I'd like to hear Dimitri's perspective on the on the Moscow relationship with both countries. But just to say, um, I think Pashinyan has, has been having some problems, but I think there's a it, you know a huge Armenian solidarity in moments like this, in which differences, domestic differences, don't matter, and we, and so I think Pashinyan, you know, it, it will have been consolidated by this crisis, particularly if if he's if it's seen that the Russians are leaning on him. I think that will only actually strengthen him. I think there's a perception um, that, 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 that the Russians uh, want to get rid of him. Um, as for Azerbaijan, I think it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. I think I mentioned this uh, in my initial remarks, but you know, uh, obviously Ilham Aliyev is riding, riding high. I, and, and many people I know who are huge critics of, of, of the regime of President Aliyev um, are in, in being quite enthusiastic about about this about this war, um, the question then is when what happens if there's a ceasefire if, if things stop, and President Aliyev has mobilised this huge um, public support which which hasn't we haven't seen in Azerbaijan since the 1990s and and will will the the public that he's mobilised behind him suddenly turn against him if they don't see what um, don't like what they see um, when when he pulls a halt. So that's that that's the question that that, that I would ask there. Great. Thanks, Dimitri. Well, um, I don't think that Russia uh, has uh, resources and the will to impose uh, some sort of an imperial peace in the part of the former Soviet Union. Basically, telling Azerbaijan stop. Uh, we don't allow you to advance one uh, one foot uh, in in the direction of Karabakh. Uh, that would only throw uh, the Azeris uh, into the hands of uh, Turkey, and uh, and any useful relationship that exists uh, between Baku and 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 uh, and Moscow. So I think that, uh, and it's interesting that although Putin took the phone four times in the last uh, ten days to uh, um, 
to answer calls from uh, Pashinyan. He never called Erdogan or Aliyev. And uh, he waited for Aliyev to uh, place a call with him on the 7th of October, which was, of course, Putin's birthday. And that's when Putin uh, discussed the conflict with Aliyev directly. There was a lot happening behind the scenes, that's, that's for sure. Even as we're speaking today, the Russian prime minister is in, is in Yerevan, um, and he is meeting with Pashinyan and, uh, and, and the others. Um, Aliyev is, is playing exactly um, on Pashinyan's, uh, let's say, um, ideas of uh, diversifying foreign policy and uh, becoming a little bit uh, closer to the West. When he addressed uh, the Russian audience, there were several live broadcasts. Uh, the Russians are, are being very careful to give as much space, as much airtime to Pashinyan and Aliyev when they broadcast their messages directly uh, to primetime Russian audiences. That, that's very spectacular. In his message, Aliyev basically said Pashinyan is a Soros-installed stooge, essentially, trying to send a very clear message to the Russians that they should not be supporting a government like that one. Uh, however, the Russians, of course, are, are, are pointing out, and the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, to the arrival of uh, various jihadis. They didn't say uh, it was the Azeri. Um, uh, the Azeri supported uh, influx, but uh, but the, the message was very clear. We don't like that. So the Russians are are, are walking a tightrope there, and uh, Putin only announced his uh, uh, invitation to the foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia to come to Moscow when he had received the positive responses from the two. So he cares a lot about how he's perceived. He doesn't want to be someone who's stepping into uh, a, somebody else's brawl, and then he is uh, essentially ejected from that. So he wants to be seen as, as, a, as some sort of a you know, senior uh, leader who is uh, uh, facilitating uh, a peace process, but who is not really uh, a party to, uh, to the dispute that, that's going on. That, that's what I would say. And I don't think that Russia's policy today is to use the war to eject Pashinyan. Uh, there are certainly uh, mixed, mixed feelings about Pashinyan in Moscow. He, uh, he jailed a couple of uh, people who were very popular with, uh, with, 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 with Moscow and he didn't uh, listen to Moscow's objections about that. But uh, at the end of the day, he did not bolt out of the Collective Security Treaty Organization. He did not bolt out of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. He accepted the geopolitical realities, the geoeconomic realities, and that's fine as far as Moscow is concerned. Great. Um, thanks, Dimitri. And one other thought, we've got some questions about sort of the, the North Caucasus, but I think you know we, we all need to, to re, you know remind ourselves that that you know, this is happening right next to the to, to the North Caucasus, which is a very volatile place about which the Russians are, are deeply concerned uh, about stability there and having any mercenaries from outside uh, in the region, I'm sure has is, is gotta be a, a big concern. Um, now, maybe we'll just uh, end. I mean, we have uh, the foreign ministers uh, meeting, ongoing negotiations. Um, you know, what, are, what, is the, what are the three of us, uh, or what do the three of you feel um, about um, uh, about you know the prospects for that, um, and then you know I think in in all three of you have have discussed you know this is very much a problem also uh, in societies and how do you how do you restart sort of the grassroots dialogue uh, particularly after this so I think there's two problems immediate negotiations but then also um, getting the, the sides both uh, the elites as well as the the populations uh, talking about this again um, um, any any uh, maybe uh, Natalie do you have any th thoughts. I mean, you know, on, uh, on, on, on the ministers' meeting, I mean, it, to me, the question that I don't have, have an answer to this is um, it, it's clear that the situation will, will end uh, the minute in which, um, you know, either a red line is, is, is passed, hmm? uh, and the question is whose red line and what red line. Hmm? Uh, 
And and I think there particularly we need to, I mean, maybe this is mainly, I would say, a question for, for Dimitri to answer, because I think it's mainly Moscow's red line that will determine the red line. Uh, but at the same time, it's clear that the, the situation will end. I mean, I struggle to see how the situation will, will end with a sort of, you know, step back to the status quo ante. So the, the question really is, what is a move away from that status quo, uh, pre-war uh, sort of status quo, um, that is sufficient uh, for Azerbaijan to be persuaded to stop, uh, but at the same time, uh, also opens up the possibility for a meaningful negotiation uh, in a manner that can uh, be acceptable to Armenia as well. Uh, and I don't know exactly where, where that space lies. Um, and, and as I said, I think if there's one actor that probably has the more, uh, the, the, the clearest view of this, I continue to believe that's Russia. Great. Dimitri? Well, uh taking the cue from Natalie, I think for Russia, the red line, the red lines are already there. It's the mercenaries and it's uh, Turkey's involvement. That's, that's an, a, a huge incentive for Russia to want to stop it. And then uh, it's Russia these days is primarily about itself. It's not about other people. And uh, I think that the Russians uh, would uh, bring pressure to bear on, uh, on both sides to, to stop it. Uh, so that those red lines are not crossed. But uh, clearly, um, returning to status quo ante is, is not an option for Azerbaijan. And claiming uh, a few villages uh, seized by the, or let's empty villages seized by the Azeri forces in this offensive uh, is, is certainly not enough to declare victory. So there must be something else. So I think that the Russians will be, uh, at this point, uh, more actively leaning on uh, both sides, on the, uh, on the uh, Azeris to, to, to stop uh, the offensive, and the, Arme and the Armenian side to uh, start making some real concessions in the, in the format of some negotiations. I think that they, they have come to the conclusion that uh, there is a break in continuity. Uh, you cannot... Uh, uh, you cannot simply go back to uh, where you were prior to 27 September. Great. And final word to Tom. Thanks, Paul. Well, um, you know, I agree with the Armenian side that, that there needs to be security, there needs to be a ceasefire. I also agree with the Azerbaijani side that, that there needs to be more politics. There needs to be the, the state, we can't return to the status quo. We need, we need a much more active uh, political process. Um, so um, we're in a very bad place now. So, so um, I, and I fear it's it's going to be bloodshed and winter, which 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 um, slows this down rather than politics more than anything else. Um, but but the final thing I'd say is 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 huge problem here. Um, the, these dehumanizing things that we've got in both. I think feeling both societies against each other and and and. And making it compromise almost impossible, and, and this has to be addressed. The leaders have to be told that they have that that in parallel they need they need, they need a rhetoric ceasefire as well as a real ceasefire, and internationals have a role to play. They need to call this out. They have to say that this these hatred hate narratives are unacceptable. That we are now starting a peace process in which the two sides um, um, we have to demonstrate that the two sides could live together in the future. Okay, I think we've lost Tom. Okay, um, well, I think he was, he, you know, he was ending up and, and, you know, reiterating the need to sort of change these narratives, which I think I would firmly uh, subscribe to as well. Uh, we are at the one hour mark and I don't want to keep anybody any longer. I want to thank uh, everybody who sent in some really good questions. Um, we did get a lot of good questions. Um, I tried to get to as many as I could. Uh, so I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Uh, to everybody in, this, in Armenia, um, Azerbaijan, I wish them uh, to please stay safe. Uh, and then I would like to thank Tom, Natalie, uh, and Dimitri uh, for your time and your excellent insights. So thank you very much, uh, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank, yep. you. thank, thank you, you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you.